Hello, my name is Brett Simpson. I'm here at Appalachian Outdoors doing the free university talk and I'm a instructor for the Wilderness Medicine Institute of Knowles and I'm here just talking about wilderness medicine and trying to encourage people to take a wilderness medicine course. <music> We would have already done our patient assessment. We know this is all that's going on. So um, we know she's um, not going to um, at least die right now. Um, and so we can start to think about taking care of her. So we have our little, uh, <laughs> you write this up as a little triangle. The first thing we do, so if someone has a wound, first thing we can do for them. That control, how would, how, easiest way to control bleeding? Drug pressure. Patient can do it themselves, then you don't need to wear gloves, which is great. Um, if we have a t shirt, anything like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, giant duffel bag of cravats. Um, we could actually just have our patient put that over, do the best to hold it with that other abrasion. Um, if it keeps bleeding through that, we can keep adding bandages. Here, we're not really concerned with whether or not this is clean, so this could be the dirty towel. I wouldn't want this to be the gas-stained rag in there, um, but really I'm just trying to control bleeding. I'm gonna clean it separately. So right now I need to control the bleeding. Um, and so here it's gonna actually maybe stop bleeding a little bit, or continue bleeding. So the other thing we can actually have our patient do is elevate. Drug pressure elevation is going to take care of most wounds. Um, a couple years ago, um, I injured myself a lot with utility knives, um, really dangerous things and I decided to chop off the tip of my finger. Um, and it took about four hours for it to stop bleeding. Um, it was never shooting blood across the room, but every time I pulled the towel out to look, it would start to ooze again. And so I'm gonna be stopped here until I can get this to stop bleeding. So it could take a little um, bit of time in here, but direct pressure and elevation will take care of it. Um, there is occasionally Oh, and actually, if my patient's getting tired of holding it with her arms up, because your arms start to get tired, I could also add some a pressure dressing in here as well. Place a bit of that for my patient. Make it a little easier. Danielle. Danielle. I have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Um, and so, we're doing that. Um, if we had a bleed that we couldn't get to stop and we were worried that Danielle was going to bleed to death in here, we do have the most extreme way to stop bleeding, which is a tourniquet um, in here. Um, tourniquets kind of get a bad rep in some ways. There is proper ways to do tourniquets and dangerous ways to do tourniquets. Um, if you've given blood before, you've had a tourniquet on. I mean, that was the goal was to um, you know, press down in that area in there so what we want to do is create a wide place of pressure. I've not had to do a tourniquet back country. I only know it from talking to our staff. The place that most people come in think we might run into it is an amputation. Um, surprisingly, according to everyone who's dealt with bigger amputations, I've only dealt with that finger, they surprisingly don't bleed very much. The body kind of knows something bad happened. I need to actually um, stop the blood flow in here. Where we're actually seeing a lot of this, and most of the data that is coming out from it, is uh, war-based things. So all the soldiers right, who carried a, a tourniquet right here, they were made to be done one-handed to yourself. In here. And so that's where we're seeing a lot of current data coming out around what was happening right, um, for soldiers. So what I would do here, or I usually do this to myself, so, is I would put it actually right above the wound. And this is, again, this is an extreme example. We're worried that Danielle is going to bleed to death if I don't actually take some type of action. And that being based on, like, pulse, how would you decide it was um, to death? We, we have approximately, okay, it has an algae bottle, that's six liters of blood in us. So I'd say about 12 of these. And so I might be looking at the ground thinking, you know, 
wow, it looks like I'm starting to fill up a swimming pool in here with blood. Um, we can be looking at, I'll well, check a little bit of shock, but we'll see things like our heart rate going up, our respiratory rates going up um, in there that can indicate some of that as well. Um, there's not a, like, you know, it's when this moment when their eyes get this bit of in here, it's more like, like, this doesn't seem like a good thing. We know we're hours away from help. I don't think they're going to be good. This is why, again, and the, the statistics come in, this does not happen in the backcountry very much. Um, we mostly show it just so we show, like, there is some theory behind how this can be. Um, so what I do, so I just made a nice wide bandage for her, and then I tie off the first part, and then I use some type of stiff item in here, and I tie that in a stick, And then what I would actually do this pinching skin. Yeah. Um, is I would twist until blood flow stops. How do I know blood flow stops? When I might see it stop shooting. Um, but I can actually find her pulse right here. She died. Let me know. She would feel numbness, tingling, um, I think we expect from circulation. Um, I'm going to actually just release for her own pressure here. If this was in a backcountry situation, what I would do now is actually tie this off so it stays. So the, the soldier ones actually have a strap that come over, so you lock this bar in place. And then this person is evacuated as rapidly as possible. 